Listen, I am so uh, excited and I am privileged and honored to stand before you today to to introduce our guest speaker. I um, want to just um, say that uh, Pastor Matthew Davis and I, we met some 20 years ago, over 20 some years ago, we met and And we met um, while I was on staff at the uh, A-Leaf uh, Baptist Church under Pastor Donna Burks under his ministry. And we met uh, there because he came and he taught the evangelism class uh, to the members at the A-Leaf Church. And so uh, we met over 20-some <clears throat> years ago, and I thank God that he allowed us to reconnect, uh, to have our paths to cross uh, one more time. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's why you never take for granted those you cross paths with. Amen? Amen? Amen. Because God has a reason for the, you crossing paths with people in your life. That's why it's so important you treat people the way you want to be treated. Amen. 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 And so I said all that to say this, that we have a dynamic preacher teacher on today. He is the pastor of the New Beginning Church in Houston, Texas. So I'm going to ask everyone to stand on their feet and receive our guest speaker on today, Pastor Matthew Davis. Amen. You may be seated. Can we get some more volume on the mic? Giving on to God our Father, to Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, to the Holy Spirit, our leader, our teacher, our confidant, and our guide. It's just good to be a new hope. And one more time. God has, has truly blessed this church and has tremendously been a blessing to me. On August the 12th, we have a comedian coming to the church. And after I sit here through this service, I think I'm going to cancel him and bring Pastor Stern to him. <laughs> Maybe I can get Pastor Stern for a few dollars less. <laughs> and we will all, we will all leave excited. God has, has blessed you with a wonderful pastor, a wonderful pastor's wife. I want to thank God for him and his wife and how over the years, some 22 years, uh, that they have been kind to me. Um, I did notice, I did notice that when I got ready to get up, the mic started messing up. And <laughs> folks started saying, oh, shucks. But I believe that God has a divine appointment, and he has blessed us again. In year 2002, there are several of you who, who graduated from the first Turning Hearts um, Ministries evangelism course. I think it was the Stearns, the Clarks, Sister Hicks. Am I missing anybody? That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much for sticking to it. I thank God for this church for making prayer and evangelism a priority. Not many churches that are labeled church make prayer and evangelism a priority. I say to the people at the New Beginning Church, if we're not going to have faith, if we're not going to walk in prayer, if we're not going to have evangelism as a priority, we might as well shut the doors and put nightclub on the sign outside because we are not a church. We're just a club, a, a place to meet, a place to fellowship. But thank you. Thank you to uh, New Hope for being the kind of church that makes prayer and evangelism a priority. 
I want to lift a word from Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. I'll be reading verses 35 through 38. In the New Testament, the book is Acts chapter 8. The verses are 35, 36, 37, and 38. I believe that God has something to say about evangelism. Acts chapter 8, verses 35 through 38, when you found it, you would discover these words. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And preached unto him Jesus. And preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doeth hindered me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all your heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. I want to talk about a critical condition, an urgent message. A critical condition, an urgent message. On Thursdays, Saturdays, and some Tuesdays, we get out our bicycles. We have a cycling ministry where we ride from one trail to the other, and we tell people about Jesus. We get our exercise in, and we also help those who are homeless. Such it was on yesterday. We were riding down and we got to the volleyball court. 7.30 in the morning, there are two women sitting at the volleyball court. They're not sitting at the mosque. They're not sitting at the church. They're not, not sitting at the kingdom hall. But there are two women at 7.30 a.m. in the morning sitting in their chair at the body ball court. And you know, they, we have all have gotten high tech now. So they have a stand with neon lights on it so everybody can see it. And it said JW.org. These two women sitting at the volleyball court at 7.30 in the morning have flyers, have tracks, and have a billboard sitting between them that said JW.org. If you don't know, you, I know some of you have already have Googled it by now. Jehovah's Witnesses at the volleyball court at 7.30 a.m. on a Saturday morning when many Christians are washing cars, when, when many folk are getting rest from the night before or the week before. At 7.30 a.m. in the morning on a Saturday morning while Christians say it's too early to get up, Jehovah's Witnesses are sitting there with the neon sign that says JW.org and they have their tracks and they are on their jobs. As we rolled by, one of the members of the, of the cycling team pointed at them and said, we as a church, we as a denomination, we as a Christian body must do better. 
because they are on their job. They are not complaining. Yes, it's hot out there. Yes, uh, it's, it's Sahara dust out there. Yes, people are surrounding them and rejecting them. But at 7.30 in the morning, on a Saturday morning, they are on their job. Not at this church, but the church around the corner down the street. Folk complain when you talk about prayer. People complain when you talk about evangelism. Folk get all in themselves and get in their feelings when, when you talk about coming up and going out. I want to say to you this morning that you need to understand the church is not the church until the church has left the building. Whenever the church leaves the building, then that's when other folk can see us as the church. The problem is other folks see us just like they see their buddies. They see us just like they see everybody else because we doing what everybody else doing. We need to understand that any chemical that sits for a long time, if it sits too long, it will damage the surface on which it sits. Let me tell you, you can't leave Ajax sitting in the same place too long. You, you can't leave awesome sprayed on your surface too long. Because if it sits too long, then it will damage the surface on which you're looking to clean. I, I stopped by on my way to the rapture just to say to you this morning, don't sit too long. Don't... don't. Don't, don't celebrate too long. Don't, don't get excited about your new car, your new house too long. Don't, don't get excited about your brand new grandbaby too long. It's work to do and we got to go after it. I want to I list some things from the text. I want to I tell you the text in Acts chapter 8 deals with Philip. Philip, one of those first deacons, one, one of those first servants, I want to stop and tell you right now, deacons and preachers, we are not called to be deacons and preachers just so we can be recognized. We are called to be servants. Matter of fact, the men of God would say it like this. We ought not leave the work of the Lord to serve tables. And let me just drop this in your spirit. The deacon is not called just to set the, the pastor on fire. The deacon is not called to just put the set pastor in his place. The deacon is called to serve tables. When you look at Acts chapter 6, you find that there's a discrimination act being filed. And the Hellenistic women are saying that we have been left over in the assembly. They are not feeding us like they're feeding everybody else. So they're overlooking us. So the apostle says it's not a godly thing for us to leave the word of God to serve tables. So go get you seven men full of the Holy Spirit that got good report that we can put over this business. I want to tell you, there was a fire going on. There was a fire, that fire in the church. You ever seen a fire in the church? It kind of begins kind of like this, girl, I'm trying to tell you. If I was you, I wouldn't do it. I don't mean to gossip, but, you know. Deacons are called to put the fire out, not to start the fire. We, we are firefighters. Leaders are firefighters. And because we are firefighters, we are called to put the fire out, not join in with the fire. So when you look at Acts chapter 6, you find the seven deacons being called. One of them was Stephen and one of them was Philip. And if you, if you follow through Acts chapter 7, you will see that because of Jesus, Stephen got killed. Stephen, Stephen was stoned to death. The Bible says that when Stephen was stoned to death, what happened was that Stephen got up and he talked about Jesus. And because he talked about Jesus and told the truth about Jesus, they stoned him. One person after the other stoned him to death. It says to me, we may lose our lives behind Jesus. But the Bible says, as they were stoning Stephen to death, as they were killing him, Jesus, who is sitting on the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us, Jesus stood up and at the stoning of Stephen. My question to you is, will Jesus stand up when you talk about him? Stephen is killed. 
We move to Acts chapter 8. The Bible says that, 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 that uh, a, a guy named Saul was in total agreement with him. The Bible says that Saul was holding the coats of the men. This statement, this phrase, holding the coat, means that he was in total agreement with it. We oftentimes tell our young people, don't hang out with this one. Don't spend time with that one, simply because they're going to lead you down a dark road. We're, we oftentimes tell our children, don't be in the car with this one. Don't find yourself with this one, because if they take him in, they're going to take you in also. We tell our children, make sure that you understand that you are just as guilty when you caught with them. Big mama back home was saying, like this. Big Mama would say if you lay down with dogs, you would get up with fleas. <laughs> Big Daddy would say birds of a feather flock together. Uh, Daddy would say you ain't going nowhere. And then Daddy would look down the street and he would say you are a Davis and when you leave here, you need to understand that your, the Davis name is a good name. And when you get back here, I want my name to be good. The Bible says that Saul, Saul was in it too. Saul was, Saul was in agreement with it. Now, hey, they killed the innocent man. And Saul was in agreement with it. He didn't throw the stone, but he held their coats. And he didn't throw the stone, but he urged them on. He didn't throw the stone, but he was in agreement with them. Let me tell you, watch who you support and watch how you support them because you are in agreement with them. God holds you responsible also. We'll move, we'll move from Acts chapter 7 to Acts chapter 8. We find out that Saul was in agreement with them and, and then we find that the Holy Spirit is running rampant. I mean, the Holy Spirit is doing his thing. The Holy Spirit, he, is doing his thing. I mean, people are getting healed. People are getting blessed. People who, people who couldn't walk are walking again. And so there was a fella named, named the sorcerer. There was a fella named Simon the sorcerer, the sorcerer himself. He was appealing to people's mind. They even called him the great man of God. And he was appealing to them, and he was bewitching the people because he was doing great exploits in the midst of the people. Let me tell you, the devil has power also. Because if the devil didn't have power, we wouldn't need Jesus. So he was amazing the people so much so until the people were so excited about what was going on, they came to him for their blessings. But when the Holy Spirit showed up and the apostles were obeying the Holy Spirit, then even Simon the sorcerer decided to give his life to Jesus. But in the midst of giving his life to Jesus, he's still a baby. We can't walk away from babies and let them feed themselves. So Simon the sorcerer began to see things that he'd never seen before. He began to see the Holy Spirit at work. So Simon the sorcerer declared, oh, give me some of that. Matter of fact, I'll pay for some of that. So Simon the sorcerer tried to buy the Holy Spirit. And the, and the, the, the man of God had to speak to him again. Be careful how you... Treat God. Be careful how you treat the Holy Spirit. Be careful how you don't recognize Jesus because the man of God said, you are going to die and go to hell just like your works and you need to make sure you change. So Simon the Sorcerer had good enough sense to say, go ahead and pray for me that the things that you have said will not come upon me. We, we move. We move now to Acts chapter 8 where we find... Beginning at verse number 26, we find that the Spirit of the Lord is dealing with Philip. I just want to say right now that if you're in a position to hear from the Lord, the Lord will speak. If you put your life in a position to hear from the Lord, he can't dwell in an unclean temple. He can't just go any and everywhere. You have to put yourself in a position to hear from the Spirit of God. My first point is to you that we have a critical condition on our hand, but we have a message that is urgent. We have critical conditions. When you look at folk and they will walk off and kill a person that they never met, that's never done anything for them, I'm going to tell you, they have a heart problem. 
I mean, they are worse than Melissa. They have a heart problem. They will kill you for no apparent reason at all. And when they stop at the red light and sit there too long, don't you dare blow your horn. Don't try to go around. Just sit there patiently and watch what God does. Because if you blow your horn, I don't know about out here, but in Houston, if you blow your horn, you may lose your life. It's because men have heart problems. It's a critical condition and it needs an urgent message. If you're born again, if you're saved, if you are a Christian, if you are a Christian, you have the message for them. God is just waiting on you so he can get the message through you in order to get to them. When you look at the text, we find, we find that, that Philip is there, and while Philip is there, he is ministering. The Holy Spirit speaks to him and says, whatever you do, go this direction near Gaza, and when you get there, I want you to just obey the Holy Spirit, the angel of the Lord. My first thing to you today is God has a, has a divine appointment for you. God has it all mapped out. God has already structured it. There is somebody that needs to hear your word. We need to get busy sharing the word of God. You, you need to understand that God will give you those instructions. God will speak to you. God is still speaking. I say to you today, my dear, God is still speaking, and he's speaking, and his voice is very clear. And he doesn't have to speak to you to tell you to go and witness. He's already said to you that you need to get up and go. In your process of going, you need to leave point A and go to point B because God has something to say to you. He has a di divine appointment. He's already selected somebody. He's already selected you to minister to somebody. And some people ain't going to hear Pastor Stern. Some people are not going to hear me. But you're the right color. You're the right size. And you have the right tone. And, and you got the right age. And you can speak to them like nobody else can. You need to understand that God has a divine appointment with divine instruction. God will tell you where to go, what to do, and how to get there. God is able. Let me just share with you. God is able to bless you in the midst of it. The question came up during class. Why should we witness? We ought to witness, first of all, because the God we serve has commanded us to do it. We ought to go and share the gospel because the God we serve has commanded us to do it. And let me tell you, Daddy would say it like this. Mama would say it like this. Mama, why I got to do it? Because I say so. She didn't, she, we didn't, we weren't allowed to ask questions. Children these days got too many answers to unasked questions. We, we, weren't ask, we weren't asking any questions. We couldn't even grunt. We couldn't even say no. We had to say no, sir. Yes, ma'am. And we had to say it with a smile even though we didn't like it. That's how we ought to do it with God. God, I don't understand where you're taking me. I don't understand what you're doing. But God, I'm going to follow you because you commanded me to. We need to witness the people because God commanded us to. We must obey the instructions of God. We have to obey the instructions of God. So, so Philip is here, and he is going to where the angel of the Lord tells him. Yeah, yeah. He didn't do the Jonah on us. Oh. Philip went where the Spirit of the Lord told him to go, and he did what the Spirit of the Lord told him to do. So we must obey the instructions. God wants to save people yeah, yeah. that don't look like you who doesn't have the money you have. He wants to save people who have more than you have. You see, rich folk think that they can make it anyhow on their money. But let me tell you, your money, as the text declares, your money in your soul will die and go to hell if you don't obey God. God, God wants to save somebody. He wants to use you to save them. He wants to use you to make a difference. He wants to use you to make sure that you tap into what other folk cannot tap into. God wants even those in authority to be saved. God wants those who carry the money bag to be saved. Deliver me from deacons who want to count money but don't want to give money. Deliver me from men who want to who wants to count money, but they think that tithing is of the Old Testament and it's gone. Deliver me from people who think that you need to make sure that everything is tight. Where does faith come? We ought to walk by faith. And when the money ain't right and things are not tight, we have to trust God to make it happen. You know, I said, you know, preachers have to be 
they, they have to be kind of structured in how they say things to you. Sometimes we have to put it in humorous, humorous way, but it's, it's, it's really true. We just can't come out and tell you what the prophets of old used to tell folk. That's why we have so many false prophets today that will tell you about 24 hours in the morning, then you will have this blessing. My question is, why does it have to be 24 hours if you can, if you can tell me when it's done? When I, grew up, when I grew up, there was a lady that sits out of the road who was a, who was a palm reader, a tarot card reader. And it was Miss Del Mar on one corner and Sister Teresa on the other corner. And people spent a whole lot of money giving their money to these women to tell them their future. Well, I had a problem with it. Even as a little boy, I had a problem with it because it, the math didn't add up. Because Sister Teresa sits on the side of Highway 82 in Greenville, Mississippi. She sit there, and her house was a trailer house. Now, it didn't make sense to me. It didn't, now, she will tell you, I just choose to live here. It, but it didn't make sense to me. When everybody is buying land and everybody is building mansions and everybody wants a big house and she got a little old shack on the side of the road. And Sister Stearns, it didn't make sense to me because if it works for me because you prophesy for me and it works for me, why isn't it working for you? Too, too many people take the okie doke. Too many people fall short. Too many people fall into that trap. That oh, if you get on this this bandwagon now, you see it's on the ground. I've been victim of it because I can't tell you don't be victim of it, but I will tell you don't go down that road. Now, I've been victim of it. You know how they do the pyramids? Oh, it's hot right now. You better get in right now. Let me say something to you, young people. The Bible says in Proverbs, money that comes quickly will leave you quickly. Just, just, just get your honest day's work. Go to work every day. Make the money, get you some good benefits, and watch what God does. You won't have to look over your shoulder. You won't have to run here to the police. Every time the police shows up, you ducking and dodging. Let me tell you, I won't sleep at night. And if you're going to get sleep at night, you need an honest day's work. You need to make sure you get what God has to give to you. And don't take anything. These rascals around here today taking stuff that they can't even use. I mean, why, why go to the porch to pick up somebody's box? You don't know what's in the box, but you just want to make somebody's life miserable. If you get a job, there are so many help wanted signs around here. Everywhere you go, there's help wanted. And you'd rather risk your life. Just the other day, a burglar got shot and killed because he's going to take something from somebody. Let me tell you, I am a born-again, baptized believer in Jesus Christ. I am a man of God. But I'm not ready to make you let you take a pluck nickel from me. And because God has blessed me with it, he can bless you with it also. The Bible, the Bible says, the Bible says, the, the Bible, the Bible says, the Bible says, the, the Bible says that Philip joined himself to the chariot and the man was already reading right where the man of God needs to pick up. I want to tell you today, not only did God tell you where to go, he will set the atmosphere for you. He, somebody that would have not listened earlier, God has arrived before you got there, and he set the atmosphere for you. You ought to be praying, Lord, set the atmosphere. Every, every Saturday, every Thursday, every Tuesday, before we mount bicycles, we pray, Lord, bless us to be living examples for you. And bless us, Father God, that we will lead somebody to Christ. Bless us, Father God, that we will meet somebody that we can introduce to Jesus Christ. And sometimes when you pray, God blesses you in a way that you don't even know about. Just last Thursday, two of us were standing on the side of the road, and we had pushed the button to go across the crosswalk. We were on our bicycle marching, and this time we obeying the crosswalk. I said, this time. 
we obey in the crosswalk. We, we obey in the crosswalk. In about five seconds after we left that area, we crossed the street and we got across the street and two cars collided and they ended up right where we were standing. I mean not an inch farther, right where we were standing. Let me tell you, when you in touch and in tune with God, God can bless you even when you don't know. Oh, the senior saints would say it like this. The senior saints would say, he bless us through dangers seen and unseen. You better hear the voice of the Lord. You better hear the voice. The next point I need to bring out to you today is this man, he carried the money bag. He carried the money bag for the queen. So it is reason to believe that he was rich himself. I want to tell you, he was coming down from worship. But he was reading the Bible. Let me say to you, when you leave worship, you ought to go back over this pericope and read over it again. And see if the preacher said what the text said. The Bible said he was coming from worship. Let me just tell you, everybody who came to worship didn't come to worship. And I want to tell you this, everybody who came to worship wasn't saved while they were in worship. There is somebody that showed up to worship for a shape, form, or fashion, and God is positioning you to reach them in a mighty way. We need to make sure that we get excited about it. The Bible says he carried the money bag for the queen, and because he carried the money bag for the queen, we need to understand real well that even while he's carrying the money bag for the queen, he's been to worship, looked like everything's add up, but it didn't all add up simply because it didn't... It didn't it wasn't right because the Bible says that he made sure that he read the scripture. And as he read the scripture, the Bible says he was unsaved. And because he was unsaved, we need to make sure that we look for people who are unsaved, unchurched, and unreached. We don't have to flop from member to member. We don't have to say, leave that church and come over here because my church is better. Let me tell you, every church got something going on in it. And you better not leave this church, go looking for something else because you do have a pastor with a pastor's heart and that love the people and love his family. If you go over there, you're going to find some stuff that's going to shake you up really. I said, I said to the folk at the New Beginning Church, I said, you think you got it going on with me. You think you got things bad with me. I can give you five pastor friends of mine. If you go over there one Sunday, you'll be running on back over here. And you will be, because you ought not be chasing waterfalls. You, you, you ought not. I, I think somebody know where I am. You, you better stop changing waterfalls. You got to make sure you show up at worship in order to worship. The Bible, the Bible says, Acts chapter 8 says it like this. He was coming from worship, but he didn't know Jesus. Everybody that comes to worship doesn't know Jesus. Don't, don't, don't fool yourself and don't like, act like everybody knows Jesus. And the Bible says at least he was sitting in his chariot and he was reading the word of God. He was reading the book of Isaiah, and it says that when he was reading the book of Isaiah, he, was, he got to the words that said he was led back like a sheep to the slaughter, and he was dumb before his shearing. He didn't say a mumbling word. He was humiliated in the midst of it. And then when, when Philip shows up, the Bible says Philip ran to the chariot. The Bible says the Holy Spirit touched upon Philip, and he ran to the chariot. I think the church today better get in a hurry. The, the church today better run to because we are losing young people by the thousand. We are use, losing young people and we wonder who we are going to lead this year to. We need young people who are excited about the Lord. Young people who will tell their friends about the Lord because young people are dying for senseless reasons. The Bible said he ran. The Bible said he ran. My book said he ran and joined himself. And the, and the custom then was to read out loud. So he's reading out loud. And while he's reading out loud, he's reading about Jesus. So he asked Philip, uh, Philip asked him, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I understand unless some man leaves me? Let me just share with you, those who are unsaved don't understand the word. So stop using catchy phrases and just read where they are. The point to you today is you must meet people where they are. 
Forget about whether they got tattoos. Forget about if they got earrings. Forget about whether or not they're doing drugs. You meet them where they are, and they will be blessed by you because God has a divine assignment for you. God prepares the heart of the witness, and he prepares the atmosphere of the person who needs to know Jesus. I said to you, I said to you in class, I said to you that you need to understand that I've been to a point in my life where the, the Bible was being preached at the Star of Hope Mission. I preached there for 12 years, and I always noticed a guy sitting way in the back. He never came up for altar call. He never even uh, came up to, to shake my hand afterwards. He never reacted to the message. Matter of fact, he mean mugged me for 12 years. I mean, mean mug. Y'all know what that is? He, 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 he sweared off on me every Monday night for 12 years. He, he looked at me every Monday night. He never would say amen for 12 years. So one day, after I finished, he walks up to me with tears running down his face. He said, man, for 12 years, I've been plotting on a way to kill you because I was sick and tired of you talking about Jesus. I've been trying to get you off to yourself so I could take you out because I've been sick and tired of you talking about Jesus. But today, you talked about Jesus, and now I met him. Now I know him. And because I met him and I know him, I want to tell you how much I love you. Let me tell you, I wanted to do my day. I wanted to clap my hands. I wanted to sing my song because one that the devil thought he had, God had brought him full circle. Hallelujah to me. We must make God's work a priority. So Philip, Philip, Philip came up and met him where he was. Too many times we want to put on people what we are. We want to make them just like us. When the truth of the matter is, it was just yesterday that you were acting a fool. You, you, want people, you want people to come to where you are. And, and let me tell you, church, we are the world's worst that kill our own wounded. Somebody has a baby out of wedlock, we just explode it. We, I mean, they used to go on Jerry Springer. But when I grew up, they would sit on the gallery and they would talk about how they're going to secure this child and how they're going to make this child better and how the senior saints would minister to this child. Matter of fact, they didn't say she got pregnant out of wedlock. They said this girl broke her leg. And now I don't know what pregnancy got to do with breaking her leg, but they would say she broke her leg. And they would just surround this girl. They would secure her. Sometimes they would keep her in for tw for. for for nine whole months, but they were trying to make sure that her psyche didn't go bad. They didn't bring her down in front of the church and make her confess their sin because the fact of the matter with me, and I don't know what y'all do over here, but the fact of the matter is, if I bring her down the aisle to confess her sin, I got to come right in front of her to confess mine. I got to come before her to confess my sin. Because let me tell you, I am torn up even today. I am torn up from the floor. Up. God has reached down into the gutter. He gave me favor. He gave me faith. He gave me his favor. And he blessed me. It's not because I'm so pretty. It's, it's not because I'm so sharp. It's not because I have no hair. It's only because of God's amazing grace that I am who I am. And I thank God for who I am. Hallelujah. Y'all are not going to let me finish, are you? I, I know that clock is kind of fast, so I, I got another 10 minutes at least. Y'all going to let me finish? I just came all the way down to Warden, Texas to testify how messed up I am. I can sit and look sanctimonious if I want to. I can act like I got it together if I want to. But let me tell you, my stuff stank as they say back home. Anybody out here want to confess right now? The confessory is open. Philip, Philip picks up. Philip, Philip picks up just where the man left off. Philip picks up right where he left off. And he says, if you don't understand, I'll eat you. Is he talking about somebody else or he's talking about himself? 
So he talks about Jesus. God is appointing you to sit with somebody to explain it to them in a way that no one else can explain it to them. And you got it, brother. You got it, sister. You don't have to be a theologian to get it. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a Sunday school teacher. Whatever God has given you, use what you got. My next point to you today is in your witness. Always point to Jesus. It's not important how pretty you are. It's not important how long your lashes are. It's not important what your hairstyle looks like. Because I've learned, I've learned, I've learned. You can have a hairstyle like mine today. And eight hours later you can have the longest hairstyle down to your neck. So it's not in your hairstyle. It, it's not in your Brooks Brothers suit or, or Jones or, or Bel Air. It's not in what you wear. It's what's in your heart. So, so the unit, the unit, the unit heard the word of God. He said, "Look, there's water. What hinders me from being baptized?" I just want to say to you, at the New Beginning Church, we don't baptize so children can eat crackers and drink grape juice. We don't baptize so children can take communion. We baptize when people have come to the conclusion as the eunuch did. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And out of obedience unto God, he gave his life as a ransom for you and me. Hallelujah. Then we ought to take him down in the water. The Bible says he took him down in the water and brought him back up. The Bible says that they both went down in the water and came back up. The Bible says he baptized all the way under the water. He was immersed under water. He was submerged under water. And the Bible said he came back up. Let me tell you what he was reading in Isaiah. It was that Jesus was buried in a barber tomb. It was Jesus that died on a skull hill Oh, it was Jesus that got up early that Thursday morning. You need to tell people about Jesus. Tell the story. And you don't have to say it like the preacher said. Just a simple story. Over 2,000 years ago, on a skull hill called Calvary, he died, I tell you. Didn't he die? He died. He died. They laid him in a barber tomb. It was a barber tomb because he didn't need it too long. It was a borrowed tomb because early that third day morning, early that third day morning, he got up with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. That same Jesus is sitting on the right hand of the Father, making intercessions for us every time we confess our sin. Every time he co we confess it, he says, Lord, forgive him again. Yeah, that same Jesus will crack the sky one day at the trump of God. At the voice of the archangel, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And those of us who remain will be caught up with him in the air. My wife won't let me sing at the New Beginning Church. She said, I can't carry a tune in a basket. But when I get over yonder, it doesn't matter if I sing tenor or soprano. I got one thing to say. Holy, holy, holy. Blessed is the Lamb that was slain. From the foundation of the world. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Over yonder is a place of no more. No more quiet. No more doubting. No more killing. No more backbiting. We're going to have church all the time. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. His name is Jesus. The righteous son of God, the horse pouring in the valley, the lily and bright morning star. His name is Jesus. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Just teach Jesus. Just talk about Jesus. If you talk about Jesus, men will lay down their evil ways. If you talk about Jesus, men will forever turn around. Talk about Jesus. He's a way maker in a heart fixed.